present over to Mr. Sonam Toge. He is a software engineer and works as a senior ICT officer for the Department of Information Technology and Telecom in the Ministry of Information and Communication of the Royal Government of Bhutan. He is one of the core team members for developing an electronic government interoperability framework, a government enterprise architecture initiative for the Royal Government of Bhutan. He graduated from the University of Western Australia with a master's degree in computer science and also he is a TOGAP 911 certified. Currently, he is leading a project to develop a whole of government data hub system. The initiative will develop a common data exchange platform for the government, enabling seamless exchange of information among government information systems and apps. Over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, thank you, Heather, for the introduction. Uh, good afternoon to all. I think I have a huge challenge right now. So we were just after the lunch and then I hope my presentation to become, uh, won't become a very sedative so that you all fall asleep. But nevertheless, uh, I'll just try to keep, uh, keep it lively. Uh, just to crack a small joke, this, uh, this morning, all of us, we talked about cloud, cloud, right? So I work for a government organization. And then every time we talk about cloud to the senior level executives and all who are from a non-IT background. So we, we, uh, because we have a Google Collaborative Suite, which is a public cloud, adopted as a government email system. And we had uh, some of our team, they went to one of the secretaries, and then they talked about cloud, cloud, and cloud. And one of our secretaries mentioned, what happened if it rains? So, <laughs> so with this, uh, just to give a quick outline of my presentation, uh, I'll be playing a video message from my honorable minister on the initiative. After that, I'll give a, a brief introduction on my country, and then followed by the overall uh, the government enterprise architecture work, plus the initiatives that we are currently uh, undertaking based on those uh, key. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the Royal Government of Bhutan, and on my own behalf, I would like to convey my heartiest appreciation to the open group for letting me share my thoughts on our EGF initiative. Also, I'd like to take this opportunity to congratulate all the award winners of the Open Group Award 2017. This award will specially help government organizations design and implement effective e-government solutions supported by enterprise architecture to tackle challenges in good governance. With more citizens becoming aware about the rights and responsibilities, their expectations and demand for better government services is ever increasing. In order to increase competitiveness and meet the demands of their citizens or businesses, governments across the globe are striving to break silos and achieve better connectedness among government agencies, businesses, and citizens through use of ICT. A highly connected and networked government allows seamless exchange of information and services among government agencies, businesses, and citizens. It is through the EGF framework that we derive insights and identify key focus areas for the ICT sector that need to be strengthened or developed in support of the business goals and objectives of the Royal Government of Bhutan. We are confident that this initiative will guide successfully in achieving our objective of a connected government, which will set another foundation towards good governance and ultimately our national goal of gross national happiness. Today, on this special occasion, I convey to you all my best wishes. Thank you and trust the uh, Thank you. Thank you for the applause. Uh, once again, uh, my team, led by my director here, we would like to thank Open Group for giving us this opportunity to present our initiative. And uh, with this, uh, let me just... So just a brief introduction on Bhutan, uh, just a very quick one. Bhutan on map, it's uh, situated between the two global giants. We have China in the north, 
the, uh, India in the South. So we need to really uh, come out of uh, ourselves as a, uh, I mean, as a key leader in the region. Um, sorry. Sorry. Sorry for that. In picture, this is how you will see people in summer. Uh, that's from one of the uh, view. Just a general profile. Uh, we have the uh, area of coverage approximately close to uh, Switzerland and Europe. Population approximately 800,000, not even 1 million. Uh, administrative units, 20 districts, and 205 blocks, comparing to 2,000 or 3,000 panchayat in India. Uh, national development philosophy, interesting to all the audience here, gross national happiness. Uh, GDP per capita is uh, 2,656. Uh, 2, the major source of income is the energy sector, mainly through hydropower and tourism. And uh, political, we are a democratic constitutional monarchy. Our king is the head of the uh, state, and the prime minister is the head of the government. Uh, just a few profile on the ICT. Internet subscribers, we have around 62% of the popul uh, population who are currently accessing internet. Fixed line across the global trade, same uh, everywhere, it's declining. Mobile penetration is approximately 88% of the population. Uh, all 20 districts, 205 blocks, they have access to internet. Uh, number of community centers, so basically for those rural uh, folks who don't have access directly to internet, we have a, inter a service kiosks, we call it community centers. So we have around 195 community centers, out of which uh, 188 are connected to the internet. ICT development progress. So this is a this is a basically an ICT um, uh, ITU Information Society measurement report 2016. So here it clearly shows that uh, the ones with those star batches are the ones those countries which are really doing well. But Bhutan, you can see, it's being listed as one of the countries who have significantly improved its ranking over the year. So that was done in 2000. Uh, that was in 2016. Uh, Bhutan's network uh, readiness index. So, from the enterprise architecture perspective, I think it's all about getting the uh, I mean, aligning the ICT initiatives to economy and socio-economic development, and then how well your uh, your organization, how well your government uh, enterprises are connected. So, this ranking, uh, basically, this measurement makes a sense. So, here, as for that, we are ranked 87 out of uh, 139 countries. So among the low, uh, you can see here, among the low middle income uh, group, uh, I mean, based on the average thing, we are compared to uh, doing better, uh, better than most of them. So typical challenges for our government. So I think uh, when it comes to uh, uh, challenges for the government, yesterday we have lots of case studies from the government, like uh, the, the state uh, government of Andhra Pradesh. Uh, we have a presentation from them. So the critical issue is that silence of information. All the agencies tend to guard their own information, then they don't share. So uh, typically, we're known for guarding our own, our own information. Repeating and overlapping government functions. So when you talk about government functions, such as uh, you will have an HR as a government function, HR related services as a government function. So that human resource related functions, it repeats across all the government agencies. So if you don't do a sort of an EA sort of a thing, then we will have that uh, sort of a repeat, uh, repeated overlapping uh, execution of those services. That's how, uh, I think that's why uh, this duplication is a typical challenge for our government. Once we have the government functions repeated, the services related to those government functions tend to repeat as well. And the worst case is that a same service, when it's done differently or when it's delivered differently uh, in two, two organizations, that's a huge cost for the government. So we can't uh, afford to uh, have multiple different standards, different way of doing things. We need to synergize and then for a small country like ours, it's very critical. Different standards within RGOB leading to interoperability uh, thing. So when my department started, the first, uh, the, the thing that we do is technical specification for ICT document. That was 15 years before. So that set the way for this, this enterprise architecture standards and interoperability. So uh, for every government uh, agencies who are procuring ICT-related equipments, they come to our department with, and then show it to us whether their ICT uh, equipments are compliant to our national standards and all of them. So that one we are still embedding as a 
standard information based within the information uh, the request architecture, which I'll be showing later. Uh, with execution of strategy, a government have a very good plan, but then it has to be executed. And whether we like it or not, the future is digital. So we have to comply to digital by default principles. So every initiative in the government has to be supported by a thing. So that's why through a tool such as enterprise architecture, uh, uh, we will be able to uh, I mean, execute those plans. Often very slow or no reaction to changes to government business involvement. Across the globe, the governments are, are facing budget constraint, and that will be very prevalent, especially for petrol like ours, which, uh, who, uh, who is still in the low, uh, uh, low middle income uh, country. So we need to innovate. And uh, enterprise architecture is a, it's a tool which will let us to do uh, all, uh, all these sort of things. Uh, so that's why the typical scenario is that we call it the spaghetti architecture. If, if you don't do it well, then we we'll end up in this mess. So EG4, the Royal Government of Bhutan, so it's basically a tool for shaping government ICT uh, uh, to support the government business outcomes with uh, key, uh, following key uh, objectives. So here we have the alignment on our initiatives to its business goals and uh, objectives. Improve coordination and increase reuses and sharing of assets and resources among the government agencies, which could mean sharing data, sharing uh, best practices, sharing information and all. Minimize duplications and maximize savings through economy of scale. For a very small country like ours, if each individual, uh, each agency start doing uh, things differently, then we don't have that economy of scale. We need to come together and then maximize our savings through that uh, coordination and all of these. Uh, reduce departmental silos and move to integrated and uh, citizen service, uh, I mean, uh, citizen centric service delivery. So the key here is that uh, all the government across the globe they talk about one stop shop. They talk, they talk about integrated service delivery. But if you don't have those enabling uh, integration layers, everything in between, then this are not, uh, you will not be able to realize those uh, objectives. Identification and prioritization of ICT programs and projects. So yesterday we mentioned that some of them, all uh, Dr. Palav here at a presentation, which says the typical challenge for a government is that every organization, every political leader, they will have their own agenda. So based on a tool such as enterprise architecture and all, we need to prioritize those projects rather than directly listening to all the uh, things. So that's why identification and prioritization of ICT projects is critical. Uh, standardization and integration. So we had similarly we had a discussion this morning on the cloud uh, cloud infrastructure integration, which will uh, and standards which will lead to interoperability. So that is applicable whether it's an ICT infrastructure, whether it's an, uh, uh, whether it's related to infrastructure, whether it's related to application. They need to uh, be able to talk to each other. So that's why that's very critical. Uh, in the EGIF timeline. So basically to realize all those objectives. We started our journey in early 2003 with a very small engagement with IDS Singapore. So they have set us on that track, basically. So after that, uh, as a part of that engagement, we were just able to do some uh, identification of key architectural domains and some survey. Uh, uh, followed by that, we have a major architecture work done in January and June 2016 in collaboration with, uh, with Vipro India. Uh, EGIF architecture implementation work, the programs and projects which we have to have out of those architecture work is continuing. Uh, so basically, I like this definition of a government enterprise architecture. So it comes from the Queensland State's uh, government enterprise architecture. So what it's saying is that it's basically it is about organizing an enterprise's resources. So our resources is processes, information, applications, technology, architecture. So basically, we may have all those uh, resources. We need to organize. Uh, put it together and make it a very complete one. So um, that's the definition of things. So without the EG, typically, okay, all the governments across the globe, they will have policies and, policies and strategies. They will have government functions and services. These are, I mean, every government will have uh, uh, this sort of, sort of setup. Government applications and information systems is there. Government data and information, uh, technologies, which are supporting all the government uh, uh, government uh, applications and things. Uh, these are all there. So without an architectural sort of an approach, so in this EG, what we have used is that we have used the adapted form of the TOGAF uh, methodology. So we have all the species around the uh, uh, whole, whole, whole common setting. So, but what we need is a 
so, so basically we also have a pro program and project control and management from the planning commissions, but we need to put it in a very structured way. So, so here, the analogy that I'm bringing is that in the earlier slides, slides it's like a Lego blocks, okay, for kids to play around. It's all about synthesizing. So now here, you have this one in the corner. Looks like a kid's play, but it's a well-structured Lego blocks with a very meaningful for the kids. So similarly, we have the government policies and strategy architecture on the top. The difference between a structural architecture and the enterprise architecture is that the enterprise architecture construction starts from the bottom up. The EA, I think it has to come from top down. So basically, we have identified the policy and strategy architecture. I'll go into detail. Uh, let, right now, I'm not going to uh, dig for, uh, further here. Then we have the business architecture. Uh, we have the data architecture here. And application architecture, technology architecture, which are supporting those business architecture and the overall goals and the visions of the government. Then we have the architecture governance and management, basically a decision making body that keeps track of the uh, works that we are executing. Uh, uh, so basically for a coding uh, purpose. So uh, fr from an architectural perspective, as you can see it here, the towards the left hand side is mostly the architectural development methodologies, we call it. So here, uh, the top ones, uh, based on uh, uh, based on the strategic directions and the visions, missions, and all. So uh, what we do is that we identify programs and projects. So through, through this uh, together sort of a thing, we have the standard information base and the programs and projects identified from the left hand side. And uh, towards the right hand side, these are the initiatives that which we need to carry out. Uh, so I think I'm sorry, these slides are not very legible from the back end. Uh, so just to dig further details into individual blocks, we have the policy and strategy architecture. So as a part of our architecture work, we have a review of a Bhutan Vision 2020 document. And this document is due for uh, a sort of a renewal, but still when we started with the, uh, I mean the DG, the Bhutan Vision 2020 is the document. And followed by, for the 11th five-year plan, currently our cycle, uh, our cycle of development is on 11th, Five-year plan basis and annual budget uh, fiscal year. So, so we have the Bhutan Vision 2020 document, document which main or uh, aim is to uh, to achieve peace, prosperity, and happiness in the country, which is very abstract. But we have those indicators which I will be presenting, and we have the UN MDG before the SDGs. So now with this 12 five-year plan starting from 2019 onwards, so uh, the Planning Commission we call it the Cross National Happiness Commission within the government. Uh, they are referring. They are. Uh, the, uh, they will be. At, uh, they will be further upgrading the Vision 2020 into something similar to the SDG, like Vision 2030. Plus, they will refer the uh, the UN's SDG goals. Um, we have the GNH pillars here. The four key pillars is sustainable and uh, equitable socio-economic development, preservation, and promotion of culture. <coughs> Conservation and sustainable utilization of environment and promotion of good government. So these are four key pillars uh, for the GNHR. So, and uh, architecture principles, I mean, this is the same across all the things. Citizen-centric approach, whole of government and sectoral perspective, rather than agency's perspective or organization specific, it's about bringing whole of government and sectoral perspective to the government. Uh, effective collaboration and coordination, mentioned earlier that for a small country like ours, we can't afford to talk differently. We'll have to come together and discuss. Architecture domain specific principles, which I'll not go into details. For, the all, for all those blocks, we have the guiding principles. Uh, programs, projects, and activities related to the, 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 uh, the this document, uh, the policy and strategy, the whole of government plan. So basically what we are saying is that these are not done as a part of EA, but basically what it does is that the planning commission, the, the GNH uh, commission is an apex body for having a government strategy thing, but the EA work has to align to those government business uh, and objectives. So we have here, for the 11 five-year plan documents, based on the GNH pillars, we have the national key result areas and the sector key result areas. So uh, for the 11 five-year plan, we have around 16 NKRAs, and SKRs are around 250. So all those uh, key result areas will have the individual KPIs based on a baseline and a target. So that's the measurement thing. ICT sector specific, we have the EGOF master plan done by our department. 
Uh, the sector specific ICT, like the Ministry of Education, we have the ICT plan for that, <coughs> Ministry of Health. Similarly, we have some other agencies. ICT roadmap, the whole of government uh, eagle policy, so that's still in the process of drafting. So what will happen is that that encompasses the principles coming out of the EG framework. Uh, the business architecture. So we have the identification of business areas, the line of business, and uh, the, the government functions and the services which are aligned to those policies and strategies. So here we have two business areas, government to government, government to citizens are the two business areas. We have the line of business around 23.20 cents. Human resource is one vertical line of business. Then we have an ICT as a horizontal line of business. So similarly, the government uh, functions we have around 55. Services, 850 uh, uh, services delivered to the citizens. Uh, government services, so as a part of this uh, business architecture, what we do is that the government services, we start cataloging the government services. The process of cataloging itself puts the organization into a rationalization sort of uh, exercise. So that is critical. Uh, organization and prioritization, all out of those 850 services, based on the government's priority, we need to prioritize those services. So that's why, as a part of the EA exercise, we do that. Organization. Typically, if you go across the government agencies, the service patterns in terms of service registry, applying for service, or registration, approval, then tracking the status, all this sort of a service pattern seems to be common across all the government. So what we do is that we come out with those uh, service patterns, classifications, whether, whether the service is common, whether the service is uh, I mean, specific to an agency or not. So that's critical. Programs, projects, similarly, the whole of government agency service capital of operation. So uh, the EGF team, we, uh, we have set up a workshop for the whole of government agencies to come together and then we have run through, uh, I mean, we have explained to them how they have to uh, prepare a service catalog for their agencies. Uh, public sector charter, so as a part of that, uh, the, the, the G2C office under the Prime Minister's office, they also have crafted a public uh, service charter. So that's, that are, those are key initiatives under the business architecture. Just to give an example here, uh, the line of business, business functions, and the service example. Here you can see, the top one is, as I mentioned earlier, we have two business areas. Um, so here the example is service to public is one business area. And the line of business, we have around 23 line of business. Agriculture could be one line of business. And here we have a government functions, approximately 15 government functions. Agriculture development is one function. Agriculture research is... Oh. Sorry. Sorry, all of us we had a lunch, but uh, we forgot to charge the battery, so it has been done. <laughs> so here, uh, from the service perspective, as I mentioned, we have the supply of seeds for the farmers and the service. So these are just an example uh, I'm giving. So here, there's another typical example. Uh, human resources is a line of business. Related to that, uh, pay and conditions is a uh, business function. Related to that, payroll processing, performance management, leave, Managing HR, these are all services under that business function. So that's an example of how we categorize, how we do a rationalization of our business uh, services. Data architecture, uh, as a part of an EG framework, so we, for those critical common data sets such as the people data, for the vehicle data, for the uh, land related data, GIS related data, we have come out with the conceptual data models for them. Uh, and identified the key data elements and uh, the relationships. So basically the conceptual data model from the architecture perspective, it's how you link the data architecture to the business architecture. And we have the data dictionaries in terms of uh, data naming conventions and design best practices, how you need to design your database, and all those best practices can be, uh, they are available. Data ownership, 
data access model, agency data owners, rules, data governing, we have all those best practices and what we do is that uh, nowadays we talk about open data, we talk about uh, APIs and all. So before making the data open, we should have all those things done. So whether the data, so that's why we have this data security classification. Before the data are released to the public, we'll have to categorize all those critical data within the garments, whether it's at a confidential level, uh, level or not, whether it's for internal use, or whether it's for public consumption. So that thing has to be thing. Then only we can talk about open data. Otherwise, we will make uh, uh, there will be several issues with this thing. Metadata is a data about data, so we comply with this uh, Dublin Core standards. Common core data. So through this Egypt exercise, what we have identified is that the people data, the vehicle data, the business, basically the business entity data, the land and the GIs are those critical data that need to be, uh, those are most commonly availed data services across the government agencies. That's why those five domains are key, uh, key priority for, for us. Uh, based on that, what we're doing is that, uh, based on that, uh, the data architecture, we have the development of whole of government uh, data service provider and data consumer matrix. So basically, later on when we move to a service oriented architecture, if you want to uh, if you want to expose your data as a services, then we should know who are the data owners, who are the data consumers. That's why we have this matrix term. Data Hub project is a very critical project. We, uh, we have started that uh, four months back, and what's happening is that uh, the Data Hub project will basically look into creating a middleware infrastructure uh, so that all the government agencies will be able to talk to each other, basically sharing their data. So we have here this, uh, the SOA infrastructure, the service quality, uh, architecture infrastructure. So the web service, the data service and web service creation, the web service routing through in the form of enterprise service bus. Then we have the analytics and the signal sign-off, which will come operational by the end of this June. Uh, we have Center for GIS Coordination under the, the Land Commission. What that commission does is that, as a part of them, they are building a GIS portal for the government agencies to share GIS-related data. So these are some of the critical uh, things uh, which we are uh, embarking on. In fact, we have started the development for the Data Hub. Uh, application architecture-wise, government application systems portfolio. So uh, we had a lot of discussion on those areas as well. For our government agencies, they should be able to know, they should rationalize all the information systems within the government. Whether the information systems are really contributing to those, uh, 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 your agency's goals and objectives. So that's why, as a part of that exercise, as of now, we rationalized around 160 plus uh, application systems. And we have classified those systems in the form of whether those uh, systems are specific to department, whether they cater to a cluster department, or whether uh, these are common systems which should go or go the same across all the government agencies. Uh, application architecture principles and building blocks. So basically, when we develop, when we outsource enterprise architecture, uh, no, when we outsource for tendering, then we, we, uh, we let the vendors comply to those uh, architectural principles, architecture building blocks, both in terms of functional and technical. A uh, critical whole of government common systems. So I will just uh, explain that uh, in the initiative. Common application uh, capabilities. This, we haven't started anything on that, but still, the whole idea is that we will have a reusable architectural component, uh, the application components, and then later on, when an, when an agency A develops an uh, application, they will be uh, able to reuse those uh, 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 capabilities. So from the initiative perspective, we have the whole of government application portfolio management term. Uh, the common systems, the civil service information system is an HR system which is common across all the government agencies. Uh, the government email and collaborative suit, which I mentioned uh, in the beginning, we have right now, the, uh, we have right now adopted the Google Enterprise uh, collaborative suit. So it's a whole, it's a common email system for all the government agencies. Uh, asset and inventory management system, we have a centralized uh, department which looks after the asset and inventory aspect of the government. So we call it the Department of National Property. So they have a common system deployed for that. Electronic government procurement, we have started six months back and it will be soon roll out. So we are having a whole of government e-procurement system. Uh, these are other common systems. We have the GPMS, PAMS, and MORB. I'm not going to uh, go into details because when you talk about government, it's the horizontal aspect expands a lot. So 
The current performance management system, only expenditure, multi-year budget rolling, these are all whole and gun and we use a single system for, uh, for the whole country. GTC portal, uh, under the Prime Minister's office, we have a GTC portal which is a citizen facing portal. So that will look uh, into the transactional and e-service uh, e aspect. Uh, national portal is mostly information perspective. And the Gov CMS, in future, what we are looking into is that for a small country like ours, every department seems to be developing different websites. And all those websites, they're either in some sort of an open source uh, uh, country management system. So in terms of security, in terms of management, it's a huge bottleneck. So that's why we, we want to move to a centralized GOV CMS based uh, websites for the, uh, for the whole agencies. That's why uh, we'll achieve an economy of scale in terms of maintaining, in terms of budget, in terms of security. So that's critical. That's a uh, plan for future. These are all operational. Uh, technology architecture, so I think uh, most of you are from a technological background, so here is I think. So uh, the technology architecture domains, we have identified around uh, seven domains there. Technology standards and specifications, since EGIF is a whole of government interface, uh, the overarching framework, we'll not be able to do uh, much on that, but we set a broad, uh, uh, we set a broad standard and specifications for, the, for other agencies to comply with. So, Similarly, the security architecture. So yeah, I need to rush a little bit because the timer is popping up in five minutes to finish. Uh, government hardware infrastructure clearance. So basically, uh, every time a government agency buys uh, infrastructure, they need to come to, they need to refer the EGIF uh, standards, and then our department looks after the compliance. Government data center. Now. Uh, we have started a government data center in a huge ways. Initially, all the agencies seems to be having their own server rooms for hosting their application. Now we have, we are slowly we are moving into a centralized government, a dedicated government center, which is initiated by my department. <coughs> government van, uh, basically we have a huge fiber optic network going across the whole country, around uh, 3,000 kilometers of fiber optic, which runs over the power line. So we have a challenge of uh, geographical landscape features. Um, and a huge uh, tough area. So we uh, we write our backbone networks over uh, power line transmission. So we have around 3,000 fiber optic uh, going across the whole country and connecting the community centers. So and all those government agencies and government uh, uh, departments they are connected to, uh, through this uh, government well. national. Uh, that's what I'm saying. The national fiber network. The disaster recovery site. We have set up the government data center and the GR site is uh, in process. So. BT cert, uh, as a part of a security architecture thing, uh, we also have a small BT cert team started, uh, mostly looking into, uh, right now, into mostly reactive services, but future will even begin to more uh, proactive with the services. So uh, I think I'll just speak this uh, technology architecture aspect. <coughs> So that's the target technology architecture based on uh, the, 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 the domains. Then we have the technology building blocks. I think these are not very visible from the uh, uh, The architecture governance and management. This is very critical for the architecture work to uh, work. So it's a decision taking body for the implementation of EA programs and projects. We have the eGov project management office within our department who takes stocks of all the ICT projects and then uh, puts through a review body. So that's why we have. Uh, this eagle PM and governance structure. In terms of governance structure, we have the eagle review committee, and after that we have the eagle executive committee, the eagle council, and then uh, the eagle council. Uh, the, 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 the dashboarding, the KPIs switch to NKRS and SKRS. Uh, that's the thing that I have mentioned earlier. Cross domain views and analysis through domain matrices. We have service to data related matrix, service to uh, application, data to app, app, application, application to technology. So EG portal is an EA repository system. So it's a custom built system. Um, we are a poor country, so we are not able to have, uh, buy tools such as uh, I mean, ISO or, or systems architect, that, that sort of thing. But we have our own rationale for using a custom EA repository. Because EA is a live document. If you print it, then it's a one-time document. If, if there are some changes, 
it's not very dynamic. So that's why we have a centralized EG portal uh, capturing to the uh, that. So projects, uh, programs, uh, whole of government review of all, of all ICT projects by either PMO, which I mentioned at the time. ICT project proposal review. Every ICT project proposal has to be sent through our EGOF uh, review process. We review those things and then uh, I mean, approve it. Government performance management system, it's basically uh, initiated by the Prime Minister's office and then it aligns all those uh, departments, annual performance contract, uh, and uh, takes whether, uh, I mean, they, uh, whether they have met their KPIs, which are set as a part of the target. So this is my last slide, uh, lessons to learn. Basically, when you talk about EA, please uh, uh, package the EA initiative as a business initiative rather than ICT or technological uh, I mean, related initiative. We get a buy-in from the highest level of government. So basically, from the e-program uh, e perspective, we have seen that uh, political will is very important. So that's why it's very critical that we get a buy-in from the ground up. And uh, let the agencies like Planning Commission or the Prime Minister's Office uh, uh, be in the front. So basically, in case of our, that's our learning this. But we have a rationale that before the Planning Commission and the Prime Minister's Office, they are not aware about government enterprise architecture. They are not aware about EG, I mean, uh, all those sort of tools. So as an IT department, we initiate it. But then once it goes into operational and all, so we recommend a Planning Commission or a Prime Minister's Office to uh, uh, turn those things. In-house EA competency, along with support from external uh, experts, I think that's very critical. So as a part of an EA development and EA implementation, it's also important that we have the team uh, internally built. So talk more about business values. Pick up the low-hanging fruit so that you can show uh, I mean, quick wins. Don't, don't start big, else prepare to get your architecture world shelf and pictures. So basically, that's similar to any other things. Don't portray the initiative as an ICT or a technical uh, uh, initiative. So don't, uh, don't reinvent, tap on existing initiatives and organizations within the government. So I think uh, these are some key lessons uh, which we have learned as a part of our uh, initiative. So with this, uh, thank you for your attention. Well, we'll just squeeze in two questions. Uh, one is, what input or impact does the happiness index metric have on implementing digital transformation? Uh, excuse me? What, what is the impact of the gross national happiness uh, metric? What does that, what does the impact mean? What is it? So what's the impact on the boss head? Uh, so basically, I think what, uh, all the ICT initiatives that we carry, okay, uh, it directly contributes to the good governance pillar of the gross national happiness. So basically, in terms of the happiness index ranking across the globe. Bhutan is somewhere uh, just between 50 and uh, 100. So but what, we say, or what I'm trying to say here is that, as I presented in the beginning, uh, we, we align all our programs to those four pillars. So good governance is one of the critical pillars. All the ICT uh, initiatives align to those good governance, which means the happiness index will definitely come up. Uh, next one. What architecture decisions have you taken while conceptualizing EGIA? I guess that means that's referring back to uh, the, the key decisions. The, the, the centralizing the EGIA. So in terms of centralization, uh, initially what happened was uh, every agency seems to be having their own ICT initiatives. So with the nodal agencies such as the Department of IT and Telecom, with this uh, uh, sort of an EA practice, we learned that uh, centralizing uh, the ICT initiatives will have lots of advantages. So that's why uh, through our governance sort of mechanism, so we bring all those ICT projects together to a central department to, 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 uh, to track those initiatives. So I think the decision is that uh, it's always based on those architectural governance uh, best practices. It's always good to, for a small country like ours, it's always good to centralize the ICT decision making. Did I answer those? Uh, if, if I haven't answered it properly, let's have any, uh, maybe a bilateral discussion after the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>